in the seconds. All right, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to today's seminar. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today's speaker is Thomas Kuhlmans. He's uh, just started the third year of his PhD in uh, Lane's group. Um, and where most of us, when we are studying, think, okay, one bachelor is enough for me. We either do mathematics or physics. Thomas is one of those brain boxes who did both, then went on to do a, ma a master in mathematics, and uh, he's now using all of that knowledge to figure out the computational efforts towards accurate line radiative cooling. So, Thomas? There you go. Yep. Thanks for the introduction. So, let me first give you the bigger picture of what we're doing in our group. What we are trying to find out is how the chemistry evolves in the universe. We see a lot of chemical species in the interstellar medium, but as we know, the interstellar medium is cold, the densities are not high enough, so there's no interesting chemistry taking place there. So any chemical species we encounter in the interstellar medium, they must originate from somewhere else. So to this end, we take a look at AGB stars. So on the left, we see a nice picture of an AGB star. And in blue, we see blue shifted material, which is material moving towards you. And in red, we see red shifted material. So what are AGB stars? As you probably know, as most of the audience see astronomers, they are low to intermediate mass stars at the end of their life cycles, which are currently in the process of shedding their outer layer. So they have significant mass losses and send a out a lot of material into the interstellar medium. And in these outflows, the winds as we call them, the environment is just right for interesting chemistry to take place. It's not too cold, nor too hot, for chemistry to take place, and we have sufficient density to have an actual appreciable rate of chemical species forming. But indeed, as the chemistry is formed in the wind, we need to understand the dynamics of the wind in order to predict, predict what chemistry is happening. And we need to do it accurately. So we see in the picture on the right a very complex outflow. So we need to try to understand this thing. It is hypothesized to happen due to interaction of the companion of the star with the wind launched by the star. But that's what we need to understand here. So what will I be doing in this giant project? Well, as the title of the seminar may reveal, I'm mainly doing radiation transport because it influences what we observe because, well, it's just light coming from the star but also influences the dynamics of these winds because the light interacts with these winds, generating radiation pressure and radiative cooling. And to compute this radiation cooling, we need a correct energy balance because otherwise we don't get correct value. So the goals of this project are to compute in an efficient way 3D line radiative transfer and use this to compute molecular line cooling. But I also want some uncertainty because when we create a model, we maybe put single value for the temperature somewhere, but there is some wiggle room with the input value we provide. So 
if we propagate this wiggle room to the output, we s still get some input, some wiggle, uh, wiggle room in the output. And that is what our uncertainty swap tower. So for this seminar, what I will be telling you is a bit of theory, then to understand what computation tricks we need to for radiator transfer, we first need the theory, then we'll apply radiator transfer to some examples. I'll briefly call, uh, tell, tell you about what cooling, how we can compute the cooling. And lastly, but not least, I will tell you how we can practically compute uncertainty. So let's get on with the theory. We start with the simplest equation, which most of us should know, the 1D radiator transfer equation. It just as light moves through a medium, it gains intensity because of the medium absorbing, uh, emitting light with the emissivity eta, and it loses intensity due to the medium absorbing light, which is denoted by the opacity. And to solve this equation, one typically rewrites it using the optical depth, which is just the integral of the opacity over the traveled uh, length. And then you also just have this force factor, which is just emissivity divided by opacity. Nothing special. But I'm talking about line radiators transfer. So what are lines? So we have our molecules, and these have discrete rotational and vibrational energy states due to quantum mechanics. They are too complicated, so I'm not going to explain them. But you need to know that these energy levels are discrete. So they have one energy value each. And to, in order to go from one excitation state to the next excitation state, they must emit or absorb a photon with a specific energy. So that's just illustrated in the figure below. So what are level populations? Well, we need to describe how much of each molecule is at which energy level. And well, that's basically it. Those are the level populations, which we denote by an I. And in case of local thermodynamical equilibrium, so are fully determined by the temperature of the medium. But in case that we want some consistent radiative transfer, non-local thermodynamical equilibrium, it also depends on the incoming radiation feedback. So now we have theory required to explain what line, em what line emissivity and line opacity are. So the emissivity given by some line source is given by this formula above. We have some energy distributed over the solid angle times the rate at which the, the excitations happen and spread over the line profile function, which I'll explain in two slides. And for the op line opacity, we have something similar, energy over the entire angle times the rate of absorption minus the rate of stimulated emission times this line profile function again. But first, I need to talk to you about Doppler shifts. As you know, Doppler shifts affect at which f frequency some moving particle is emitting photons. And the clue is that these line emissivities and line opacities, which I've talked about, well, they should be computed in the frame of the particle itself. So we need to shift the frequency, obviously then we can get to the line profile function. Because I've told you the energy levels are discrete, so I expect a direct delta function for this line profile. Well, no. These particles of gas, these are moving around a bit because the temperature is obviously non-zero. So due to Doppler shifts, these lines get broadened from this direct delta to a Gaussian distribution, which we see here. There exists more complex line profile functions like the voice for voice profile and other more, even more complex functions, but we are not going to talk about them in this seminar. So let's get on to LTE radiator transfer. In this, we make the assumption that there is everywhere a local balance between the energy levels given by statistical thermodynamics. So statistical thermodynamics gives us this Boltzmann distribution from which we can easily derive what the fraction of each level must be. And using these levels, we can just plug them into our line emissivities and line opacities. We can compute total emissivities and total opacities. But remember, this is only valid in high densities. And it does not give us a correct energy balance. So we need NLTE, line radiative transfer. 
And for this, we need one extra equation, which is a statistical equilibrium equation. And instead of assuming this local balance everywhere, we assume that for every point in our simulation, the, energy, uh, the level populations do not change in time. So what is this equation? Well, we notice here in this thing, it is just the rate of the excitations minus the rate of excitations times some mean line intensity, which is just the intensity averaged over all directions, averaged over this line profile function. Second line, we see exactly the same with a minus sign, but that's because the role of the upper and lower levels has changed. And in this third line, we see that there are also collisional transitions. So that's everything we need for NLP with AV test transfers. And with that, we can compute cooling. But first, we obviously need to calculate our level populations self-consistently. So how do we do that? We need an iterative procedure. So we start with LP level populations. From these, we calculate emissivities and opacities. From these, we calculate intensities. And then back to level populations, we go with the statistical equilibrium equation. Repeat for a few iterations, and you get your self-consistent AVA test transfers. Then the cooling is given by this simple formula. You notice on the right, this is just energy of a photon, and this is just the rate, the net rate of collisional excitation. So that's it for the theory. Now on to the computation methods. In the literature, we know quite a few computation methods for radiative transfer, including the moment method, which is just you take the radiative transfer equation, you integrate it over the entire solid angle, and you get the zeroth moment. You do the same, but you multiply the radiative transfer equation with the direction vector, you get the first moment, and so on, and so on, and so on, until you say, enough is enough, I need a closure relation. And you just apply a closure relation. Advantage is that this is quite fast to compute. Disadvantage is that you need to assume the closure relation, and the validity of your results depends on the validity of this closure relation. Then you have the Monte Carlo method, which is the most intuitive method of all. You have your simulation domain, and you just let loose some photon effects. This may travel through the simulation, and that's it. Now, the disadvantage of this is it's a Monte Carlo method. I never know when to stop them. So, and then last but not least, thing we will be using in this seminar is a ray tracing method. So, for example, we want to compute intensities at this point here. What do we do? We trace uh, in a specific direction. We trace some ray to the boundary, and we start solving our radiative transfer equation on this ray until we have an intensity at this point. The advantage is that it's a very accurate method, but the disadvantage is that it takes a lot of time. And now I'm taking a break. So how much time does it take? Oh. How much time does it take? Well, we can make a rough estimate for calculating NLP radiative transfer. Obviously, the computation time scales with the number of points in our simulation, slightly more than linearly. It scales with the number of lines we use in our NLP radiative transfer, because N computing NLP for a single line doesn't make sense, so we need to take more lines than one. It scales with the number of angles we use to average to average out this intensity, and it also scales with the number of frequencies we use to evaluate this line profile function. So in short, we need everything to compute this mean line intensity. Because it's uh, expensive, we need some optimizations, uh, ob obviously maintaining the accuracy of our results. So first of all, how do we compute an optical depth? Let's say that I want to compute an optical depth for a small step in our domain, so from here to here. Then what we just do is try to discretize this integral. Typically, one uses the trapezoidal rule. It just says I use the intensity here, uh, no, opacity here, I use the opacity here, I average it, and times the distance I've just traveled. This is denoted by this shaded region here, the optical depth we compute. But as you see, it might not be entirely accurate for higher velocity gradients, because what I actually want is the area under the curve here, not this tiny area. 
And this is due to the thickness of this line profile. So what do we do? Well, we just analytically integrate out this line profile function. We can do that. And then we get the following formula, something that looks very similar to the trapezoidal rule, but we have just deleted the line profile function in this opacity, and then just the analytical integral of the line, uh, of the line profile. That works. So on to our next step. We want to compute NLT radiative transfer. It's an iterative process, and it might take a long time for conversions to be reached depending on the optical depth of the model. So what can we do to speed it up? Well, we can use acceleration procedures. See title, and the acceleration works. And what does it try to do? It tries to find the fixed point. And with the fixed point, I mean, if we set the simulation in a certain state, and we do one iteration step, we come back to the exact same state. That's when the model is converged, obviously. So for NP acceleration, we do a few iteration steps. Then we look at our level populations and say, oh, I can try to extrapolate them and do the extrapolation using some mathematics and repeat until we have reached convergence. But there is some kind of arbitrariness in this whole procedure. That's namely the number of steps we take. This is some arbitrary parameter and it's mostly fixed most of the time. So what I can do is take some inspiration from Frederick's thesis and just say, hey, we don't need to necessarily take exactly six steps before we do this acceleration step. We can do it earlier, but when? Well, to do that, we need a criterion. As we can check, in the same way that we can check the convergence of the level populations during normal iteration step, we can also check the convergence of the projected accelerated steps. And then if the accelerated steps converge slower than the normal steps, we just use the accelerated step. And that works fine, as I try to show in this slide. So what do I try to tell you? Well, I apply this to a benchmark model, which is used for NLT radiative transfer called the Van Zadel 1 model in the Van Zadel 2002 paper described. It just describes a spherically symmetric point cloud with a parallel density distribution, no velocities, just a simple model. And now I will explain what these complex figures mean. So on the left, I have, we have two versions of this Van Zadel benchmark. We have an optically thin and an optically thick version. And on the y-axis, we see the convergence. So lower means more converged. On the x-axis, we see the number of iterations we have taken. So let's take a look. Ah, yes, something I need to explain. I have dashed lines and solid lines. Dashed lines means the old NP acceleration. And solid lines means the new method that I've devised. So as we see here, essentially we want our models to converge as fast as possible makes sense, so we want our models to be lower left possible, so. And it happens that no matter what arbitrary values we take for the maximum amount of steps with our adaptive method, we find good results for both the optically thin version and both the optically thick version, ignoring the fact that if we set the maximum limit too low, the results will be exactly identical to the normal NG acceleration step because, well, Criterion says, no, you must now say the step, the maximum steps have been reached. So this might have been a bit complicated. So let's take a breather while I try to explain you how you should evaluate a sum. So I have shown you equations for the individ individual line opacities and line emissivities. But we actually need a total opacity and total emissivity. So the naive way is just sum them all up and you get a total emissivity and a total opacity. Well, I agree, that works, but it's a bit computationally inefficient, as I will try to show you here in this slide. For example, we want to evaluate the total opacity at this specific frequency. Then we see only one line lies in the neighborhood with this line profile function, and all the other lines lie a bit too far off. So they are practically zero when we evaluate them. So just don't evaluate them, there's no point. It's quite simple. 
Now that we have some kind of optimization tricks, we can move on to the application. So I will introduce to you my grid, which is a 3D NLT line radiative transfer code, originally developed by Frederick at the University College of London, and also at K11, and now continued developing by me. So what it is, is a Python, uh, it's a C++ code, obviously for computational reasons, with a Python interface for convenience reasons, making it actually usable without recompiling it constantly. It's mainly used for post-processing hydrodynamic simulation, of which I will give some examples. So you give me an hydro simulation and I can give you an image at a specific frequency, but we can do more. We can create gamma maps, which are images, well, it's just a stack of images at specific frequencies around the line's center. And by using the Doppler shift, if we have slightly higher frequency, that means that material is moving towards you. Slightly lower frequency, that is, means that it's moving away from you. So it gives us an idea about the structure, and we can also plot the line profile as you're used to below. So I'll give you a few examples. I'll first start with some protoplanetary disk example, and then a phantom, which is an SPH hydrodynamics code, HB binary simulation made by Olini. So let's take a look at this analogy disk. It's just a star with a protoplanetary disk around it. It's not that interesting, <laughs> but we have a Keplerian velocity field which just rotates around. And then we can take a look at the channel map. So you notice these squares, these are all individual images at a specific frequency. This minus focal images per second means it's moving towards you. So we have this material moving towards you on this side, and we see, look at the channel maps, and we see it's indeed rotating just as I expect it was. Okay, now we can take a look at an AGB binary simulation. So we start with an AGB start, which launches wind, and we have a binary companion at an eccentric orbit. This creates, the simulation creates some nice spiral structures. So we have AGB star in the middle, some binary companion, which you can't actually see due to me plotting the mesh on the top of the density. And then we can create gamma maps again. So it looks quite nice. And that's all I can say about it because I don't write papers about the exact structure of these spirals. I'm sorry. Okay, now you have noticed that we have way too much, might have way too much details in this density plot I've showed you. Well, we might just need to remesh the model. And what do I mean with remeshing the model? Well, we have way too much detail in specific parts, but maybe the parameters like density, temperatures and such do not change significantly. Then we start wasting computation time because we know that the time it takes to compute NLT radiative transfer scales strongly with the number of points in the model. So I've just plotted a stupid illustration here, just arbitrary data axis, arbitrary point axis, and I want to put points in locations where there is some data variation, not when there is no variation in the data. So this idea is not exactly completely new. It was first of um, idea now, I'll take a break. So the idea of remeshing radiative transfer models is not exactly new. Frederick has done it previously using Gmesh, but it's a bit hard to maintain an external dependency and it was a bit slow to remesh. So what I show here to you here is a new remeshing procedure. So the goal is to preserve detail in the interesting regions. So first, I make the stupid assumption that I can replace my entire simulation with one box. It's constant everything. Well, that obviously doesn't work, so we split the box into pieces. And then we check for each of the pieces. Well, is it, are the differences in these regions significant? If yes, we need to split the boxes again and again and again recursively. And that method works, so let's assume check out the result. On the left, you have the original mesh again, and on the right, you have the remesh mesh. 
which looks quite a bit square if you take a look closely, but that's expected because I uh, divided it into squares, so I expect squares. But most importantly, we can take a look at the time it takes to compute NLT radiative transfer. An original mesh with more than a million points, it takes now three hours or something, three hours, let's say. And in reduced mesh, it, with only 100,000 points, it takes 10 times less time, which is great. But are the results the same? Well, if we just make an image of both models, you can't really see the difference, can you? Taking a look at it, no, I can't. And you can certainly can't because it's on this large screen. And yeah, for actually, for the actual discussion of the differences between the different meshes, I refer you to my paper in PrEP, which should come out sometime ever. <laughs> so now on to cooling rate. So there already exists some key, some cooling rates in literature. So I have, for example, put some cooling rates by Neufeld here. So it's just a formula and a table on the right for determining these parameters, depending obviously on densities and temperatures. Well, can't we just use these for our 3D simulations? I would say yes, but these things are computed for 1D models. So it's not strictly valid for 3D models and we make an additional assumptions in there. For example, in this Neufeld paper, we assume that, that radiative transfer can be computed locally using the Sobolev approximation for computing optical depths. So what is my goal? Well, how will I be able to compute radiative cooling rates? So the first goal is to implement them, of course. I have my formula, so that's, that works. And just test whether it act is actually correct what I calculate. Then I'll apply it to a few 3D simulations of AGB stars, and I'll test it for a few different molecules because obviously different molecules result in different cooling rates. Then I'll analyze the results with some uncertainties, and I'll decide on a good proxy for computing the cooling rate because I can't do this while the hydrodynamic simulation is running because Radiative transfer is just too slow, even without optimizations. So on to uncertainties. So why do I want uncertainties? Well, as I said, I want to compute cooling rates, which cannot be done on the fly. So my goal is to create some table fits or something else, maybe even a neural network to calculate the cooling rates. But I do not know how accurate it must be. If I am off by 10% on the cooling rate, is it bad? Is it good? I don't actually know. So to quantify this, we need to know some what uncertainties we can expect. Depending on the uncertainty of the input we put in our model, we get some uncertainty on the output of our model. Yeah. So how do we do this? Typically, one uses Monte Carlo type methods, meaning we just run a lot of simulation for slightly different parameters. But as I've said, NLT radiative transfer is too expensive for this. That just doesn't work. What I actually want is some idea about the output changes with respect to the inputs. So with respect to changes in density, temperatures, etc. Some kind of gradient, as you might say. So wait, what is PyTorch doing here? Well, PyTorch is a machine learning framework with Python interface for training neural networks, but that doesn't really help us. What I'm considering it as is just NumPy or an advanced version of NumPy. So why would I ever try to program in this advanced NumPy? Well, it's Python, so it's relatively easy to program in. It's made for machine learning, so it has de decent parallelization capabilities. I actually get it for free if I just program it correctly. I have some access to an automatic differentiation module which I'll get to later. And there's no compilation required. So when I encounter a bug in my code, inevitably, I don't need to wait five minutes until the code is compiled to try to fix the bug. But that's also a downside, of course, because if it's not compiled, it runs a bit slower. 
And as you know, with NumPy, it's sometimes not trivial to implement some operation, especially if your data is of different input sizes and you try to compute something else. Okay, so what's automatic differentiation? So assume that I, for some reason, want some kind of derivative of a complex function or some kind of gradient or something. Well, then you can use the entire function, split it into different parts, manually compute the derivative of each individual part, and obviously use the chain, chain rule to combine all those different derivatives. But doing this manually is way too much work. That's why we have the computer, which, we, which can do this for us. Okay, so now, how do I practically compute strain surfaces? But I said it's a machine learning framework used for training uh, neural networks ma mainly. But I will not be using some kind of neural network for uncertainty quantification because it's too hard to interpret. I want to know what's going on with my uncertainty. So that's not what I will be doing. I will just exploit what PyTorch offers implicitly so it offers this automatic differentiation, and for computational efficiency, it also offers GPU support. And using these gradients I can cal I calculate with this automatic differentiation module, I can check the sensitivity of the output of my models with respect to the input of my models. Okay, so now I can introduce my grid torch. This is a Python port of my grid built on top of PyTorch. It has GPU support for parallelization, and it also has automatic differentiation for uncertainty quantification. And because I like AstroPy units, I also use AstroPy units for input and output, so that I never ever make a conversion error again in my inputs. We've all been there, no, I don't want it anymore. So, can we do sensitivity analysis? Yes, we can. So I've just plotted another model by Raft, which is an Euclidean spiral model. It has some spirally density structure and some other things, but that's not important. Main thing is we can create an image from it. But what, for example, but now we want to know what happens if we were to increase the temperature with, let's say, five percent or so. Well, then we can look at our theory and say, ah, the line profile width probably increases, the level population changes a bit, and then we need to propagate all these changes throughout the entire computation. That's a bit hard to do manually, but luckily I have my trusty automatic differentiation module, and I say, well, PyTorch, I have this input gradient. Well, then PyTorch gives me the result with the output gradient, and we can plot it. So in this case, well, we see that the intensity of the images just changes upwards most of the time. And that's it for the seminar. There's a few things I'd like you to remember. Mainly, 3D NLP radiative transfer is very computationally expensive, but we need the NLP part in order to calculate radiative cooling. But luckily, we have some optimizations to make the computations a bit cheaper. And the goal of my project is to eventually compute molecular line cooling rates in order to get more accurate wind dynamics for these AGB star simulations. Okay, that's it. All right, thanks for the very enjoyable seminar, Thomas. Questions? Uh, I like to talk quite a bit, but I have a question on the um, regridding where you do in the squares, where you, you explain it as I just take the square and I re-square it and re-square it until I'm happy with it. Um, is there, I mean, I'm just wondering, but if there is there an extra advantage that now you have a quite square grid, I'm assuming, I with some extra... Um, with some extra grids in there, I guess, but you go from this phantom thing, which is very random points everywhere, to a pretty square grid. Can you take advantage of that somehow to make it faster, or is that limited? Well, not really. Squares is just easy to divide into.
uh, Thomas, very nice talk. Um, so I'm no expert in relative transfer, but I've heard of other codes like MC Faust or Red MC 3D, and I was wondering how is Magrit different to them? Is it faster, or is it the computational tricks that are different, and or is it the other codes that do not handle well uh, ra line relative transfer? It's more the latter part. We are actually the only code that does de de detailed NLTE line radiative transfer. So that's why Magnet exists. Hi, right, Thomas. Thanks for this. Um, you show uh, these channel maps, right, which you can create um, centered around, I guess, a certain, I guess, in, in, in application to Alma, like a CO line, for example. But can you also create like broadband images um, out of this, or is that way too uh, expensive? Good question. I've never actually tried it. So for broadband images, you just need frequencies very, very far spaced apart compared to this discretization. Um, maybe. I haven't actually tried it. I see no reason why it shouldn't work, but it might be computationally inefficient because we are not really built for it. Uh, nice to talk, Thomas. I have an additional question uh, with regards to the regridding that you do. Um, so I understand that uh, you, you regrid this to, again, uh, a non-mesh type of point distribution, but isn't there often a lot of information, the fact that you have like uh, regions of, of uh, homogeneous or uniform gas and then something different? And if you regrid your, um, uh, so you regrid your, your big planes of, of slightly homogeneous gas to like one new dot, but for example, uh, because we're, we're looking a lot at, at stellar winds, if you have a wind that's stable for a while and then has a shock, and you want to model your, your stable part and your shock very sharply. D don't you miss that a bit if you regret it like this, if you get my question? D don't you smooth out shocks? That's, I think, the, the short question. We will indeed smooth out shocks a bit because we regret, but because of the criterion we use to remesh, we still need quite a lot of detail in these shocks because there the conditions change a lot. Any more questions? Okay, uh, I still have one and you're actually on the perfect slide for me. Um, here uh, you show how much the recursive reduced mesh um, improves your computation time. Um, you've also shown us other um, speed-ups uh, for the calculation. Which of all of these would you say is the most important? Uh, right. um, they're all a bit important because they're multiplicative. For reducing the mesh, that's independent for calculating, for example, the total opacity or total emissivity. So you can mult all multiply them, actu actually. So I'd say they're all important. Okay, thanks. Last chance, any more questions? No? Okay, then thank you all for coming. Uh, let's thank Thomas again.